number one populated county in the, uh, all of uh, 133. There's 40% of the vote that has not yet been tabulated into this, okay? Uh, Biden, sorry to interrupt. Sorry, what's that? Where was it for Biden? Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I'll show you. Yeah, I, I sure will. So a lot of that 40 percent outstanding is going to go for Harris, but we just don't know how much in the most populated county. OK, so go back four years. This is 2020. This is Joe Biden at 70 percent. OK, so Kamala Harris, she has time to make up for that, given the fact that that vote is still out. And I, I would say just looking at Georgia a moment ago, Fulton County looks to be somewhat similar. And the reason is, I'm going to explain this to you, okay? Fulton County is the most populated county in the state of Georgia. You're getting a lot of Democratic votes from out there, all right? She's up by 46 points, all right? Pretty good margin, by 202,000 raw votes, okay? So four years ago with Joe Biden, he won the county with 242. His, his margin on a percentage basis was a bit higher, about two points. But 242,000 in a state... Four years ago, uh, sorry, excuse me, I apologize. Let's go statewide here. In a state that was determined by 11,779. Let me go to my cheat sheet here, guys, all right? I can do something that's a little ugly, but for the sake of the audience at home and for our knowledge, too, this was Georgia in 2020. Wow, look at this. Okay, again, we've taken a 24-hour period from four years ago. Blue is the Democratic vote. Obviously, red is the Republican vote. And you see all this, you know, at seven o'clock, boy, it was all over the place. OK. And then in the eight o'clock hour, Trump easily took a lead there. And then the margins started to close overnight around 3 a.m. The lines moved and they moved and they moved for several days until finally we reached that margin of 12. Brett, what are you looking at? Well, I've been keeping an eye on this issue that was raised in our uh, voter analysis that said that fully half of all voters said the future of democracy is the most important factor in their vote. That's a big number. I mean, that's a lot of people worried about that. Now, now Trump gets some of those voters, but 60 percent of them are more going for Harris. I think that issue, democracy, is about one thing, about Trump and fear of Trump. So it's the same. It's the same factor we keep coming back to time and again is, you know, the Trump factor in this race is you know, is he able to overcome the resistance to him, which has been so dominant in pre three previous cycles? And that's what that vote is about. Because if you were just running on the issues uh, that include the most important economy, immigration, right, right. You, you wouldn't see. You wouldn't see that. But, but you got half of people thinking that's important. And that's was, a Trump. That's a, that's a Trump. A issue. huge issue in for 2020. Yeah. And it also resurfaced a bit with candidate selection in 2022 did. that he got blamed for. So the question is, are we going to see the increase in his approval numbers translate into something positive? And, for if him you, tonight? and if you work your way back to what that's about, that's about January 6th. Yeah. Can I clarify and the price something? he paid politically for January 6th is is still being paid. Because, and it also but, was hammered over and over again by former president, uh, by current president Biden, the former candidate. Yeah. You know, the threat to democracy was really on his lips pretty much every minute. And, and, and Vice I, President Harris didn't take that ball for a lot, uh, but she did come back to it towards the end of the know, campaign. The other thing about it I think is striking is it shows you the power of the media, because in many ways, it's a BS issue when you think about it. I mean, think about it. Go back to January 6th, which was supposed to be the moment when we all thought we should fear this our democracy was fragile. It was the premise of the January 6th special committee that, that we, as, as the co-chairman of the committee put it, we came critically close to losing our democracy. It's ridiculous. I mean, that, that uh, our democracy is pretty sturdy. Our it checks and balances issue. worked. Um, the thing was over in a matter of hours, and yet here we are. It's still a factor. And he thought that we would know pretty quickly this election season who won, but... I'm not sure that we're going to know before midnight, at least. It's defined pretty quickly, right? right. Compared to 2020, it could be pretty quickly. We're at 10 o'clock hour. You're right. So, you see, these states thought they, you know, they learned a lot of lessons in 2020. Fewer mail-in votes this time around. So they thought they'd be faster. But human things happen. You see the officials all out there watching this. Brianna made a very key point. It's so sad that we have to make it but that these voting machines are not connected to the Internet. Right. There's all these conspiracy theories that people are hacking into voting machines. The people who count our votes, whether they're Democrats, Republicans, agnostic, they do a good job in all of the states. And North Carolina is one of the best. So where are we is the question. A 213,000 vote lead. And it's what Pam just laid out and Bree just laid out. Uh, Bree is here. Brianna is here. Mecklenburg County, 10% of the population, the largest of the 100 counties in 
you know, North Carolina. So we have a long way to go, right? So you, can the Democrat come back is the question, right? You see that healthy Donald Trump lead. So your question is, can the Democrat come back? Well, the vice president's at 65,000 votes there and a little bit of change, okay? Mecklenburg County, the winner of Mecklenburg County is going to be over 300,000, close to 400,000 votes. So we have a very long way to go in Mecklenburg County. So the point you're making here is that Joe Biden pocketed a net of about 200,000 right. votes last time. Last time, a net of about 200,000 votes, exactly the way to do the math. And we see right now, you know, we're, we're just we're waiting for a whole lot of votes, right? And so she's at 61 percent and he was at 67 percent. If it ends up that way, Donald Trump's going to win North Carolina. You know, but, but there's that giant number of votes left out. So does, her, does the vice president's percentage, remember the president's 67, you know, does she get closer to 67, number one? And then number two, what's the raw math in the margin, right? If, Donald Trump, if, if she's below Biden's number, that means Donald Trump's, again, doing a little bit better. Might only be a little bit, but a little bit's a big deal in a battleground state in the suburbs. Or maybe it's with black voters in, in Charlotte. We'll have to see how that plays out. That's the biggest county. Pam noted Wake County is your number two. And again, here we're higher. We're at 76 percent. So she's at 64 percent. Remember, Joe Biden lost North Carolina only by 75,000 votes, but he lost. So you're trying to figure out how, how do you match that up? So you come back here and again, it's not a lot. right? You see the wind is turnout might be up a little bit. So maybe the winner of the county gets a little bit more than that. But you see him at 393 and more importantly, at 62 percent of the vote. And then you come here. So she's she was a little behind the president in Mecklenburg County, which is the largest. So you don't want to be behind it where the most votes are. She's a little bit ahead of the president in Wake County. And we're waiting for that out. And that's one of the challenges, right? We, we compare her to Biden because that's the last election. Every candidate has their own coalition. Right. right? And, and so if she's doing a little worse than him with some voters, can she make it up somewhere else? Or is Donald Trump, you know, matching his numbers and do that? If you want, you can look at it this way if you want. Let's just come out and bring this in here. Where is Harris overperforming Biden in the state? Right. So this will slide away in just a second. She's only overperforming Biden in the state in a very small number of counties. One, two, three, four. Right. And so, you know, does that mean she's going to lose North Carolina? No. Uh, it just means that she's, you know, we have to wait to see those votes. And then you, you can flip the question. Right. How about Trump? Is Trump overperforming Trump in 2020 in a lot more places at the moment? At the moment. Key to that is in these blue areas in Mecklenburg County, which we just noted. That's where the most votes are in the state. In the biggest of the 100 counties, population-wise, vote count-wise, is right there. And Donald Trump's overperforming his 2020 performance at the moment. Remember how many votes are still out? At the moment, he's out overperforming. And he's overperforming here in the Fayetteville area. If Donald Trump overperforms in the urban areas where you have an African-American population and then the close-in suburbs, then Donald Trump's in better shape now than he was then. I just want to remind people as we close this out, though, that I said he's overperforming here at the moment. We only have 18% of the vote, so let's see if it holds up. And I said he was overperforming here at the moment. We only have 21% of the vote, so let's see if it holds up. Again, with all the caveats you just said, that this is early, we don't know. But if that were to hold, an explanation of it can come in what we've heard from both campaigns is that Donald Trump is doing a little bit better with African Americans, uh, especially African American but men, than he did last time. And that Kamala Harris is overperforming uh, with white suburban women, uh, which you would have in, in Raleigh. Yes, so that, that's, the, that's what we're trying. This is why I spent 15 months traveling, right? Where is she? Where's the addition? Where can you perform better? And for Donald Trump, since he's the constant, he was on 2016 and 2020, for Donald Trump, his most, he had two goals. Number one, keep your base. In 2020, Donald Trump got more votes than he did in 2016, almost everywhere, right? His base came out. Where he suffered was in the suburbs because there was higher Democratic turnout. So if you're Donald Trump, yes, you want to pick up as many black votes and Latino votes as you can, and you want to improve your standing in the suburbs. And that includes women. It includes women. Donald Trump spent the Republicans are ripping their hair out the last week of the campaign every day watching Donald Trump insult women. Uh, you know, pick your day. It was Nancy Pelosi one day. It was the vice president of the United States every day. It was women writ large some of those days. Republican strategists were ripping their hair out because they know if Donald Trump improves his standing in the suburbs, you know, literally, literally yeah. by half a point, then he's the next president of the United States. And they're ripping their hair out. But, but as you watch through this and we go through it, we'll see how it performs out. I just want to keep checking here. 213,000 votes, but we're, we're still here. So mathematically, you do it this way. The big question is, are there enough votes out there for the candidate who's losing to catch up? A lot of blue. The answer is yes, there are enough votes out there for the candidate who's losing, the vice president, to catch up. That doesn't mean she will. 
It doesn't mean she will. It just comes down to as we get more votes in those. It's broken. I'm going to fix it. I don't want to drop the ball on what Dana said, though, about what people mean when they are dissatisfied. It's the same thing about what they mean by democracy or being independent. It's not entirely clear until we're closer to the final tallies. No, absolutely. Uh, but the battleground states are Aaron Burnett's beats tonight. Uh, Aaron? <laughs> <laughs> they are, and of course, we're just moments away from uh, polls closing in a lot of these states in these final crucial minutes, really, in North Carolina, crucial minutes. Uh, Brianna, where you are in Charlotte, uh, the people still have to vote, and we're starting to see some of these exit polls, concerns about the economy, the dissatisfaction that people have. What have voters been telling you? Uh, they've been telling us, Aaron, that everything matters. We're here in Mecklenburg County, which is going to be closely watched. It voted 66% for Joe Biden in 2020. And this is going to be very important to see the result here, to see how Harris performs compared to how Joe Biden did in 2020. I'm joined now by a voter, Brian Flores. You just voted. I did. And who did you vote for? For Harris. And tell me about how you came to this decision. So I wasn't going to vote at all until my girlfriend was blowing up my phone telling me to go vote. And if I didn't, she was going to break up with me. So now I'm here. Was she seriously going to break up with you? No, I, I, I made that up. She didn't say that, but, <laughs> but it's funny to say that. So. so she asked you, she asked you to vote for Harris. She did. And so you voted for Biden in 2020, but what were you going to do this time? I wasn't going to vote at all. You were just going to stay home? I was going to stay home, eat some chips or something. I don't know. And so you came just before polls closed. But here's the thing. How long did it, it Most people have been saying it's taken them five or ten minutes. Tell us mm -hmm. how long it took you to vote. So I got off of work at 4.30, um, drove here about 30 minutes. I think I walked in like at 5, oh five ish and I was waiting for about two hours. I just walked out. Two, so, Brian, two hours to fix your address, right? Two hours. Brian Flores, thank you so much. Aaron, back to you. Well, that's devotion. That's devotion. Two hours to fix the address and to stay there and to vote. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> I mean, all right. Um, you know, John, but that those are the stories the Harris campaign wants. You know what? More stories like that. That's a vote today that was not going to be there yesterday or the day before. That is right. Which, in a competitive race, it starts with one. And that's how you build. Right? So what do we have so far as we look at the map? Let's come out to the big picture first and show you. Sorry, I was just peeking in there. It's early. That's the, the big headline here. Look at a lot of that gray as we go from east to west. We have a lot to... But keep some solace in the fact that Donald was promising a quote-unquote too big to rig win. And neither of them are going to get that. Right? Like, obviously, I'm not suggesting it, it, it is in any way not an accurate result. I do have faith in the process. I do despite all my concerns about the long lines and how that's unfair and seems to be affecting a lot of young students and those tend to be Democrats, but that's, that's a broader philosophical discussion. He was promising a victory so large it would be over by this point, and it hasn't. And listen to that. Listen to how they're still, quote-unquote, pulling their hair out. And also listen to the fact, guys, that at Fox, they're warning people. They're warning people about how some of the questions people rated as most important don't bode well for Trump in the shadow of J6. And also listen to what they said at Fox. It was very late into the night last time. Very late. When everyone thought that mm, Donnie might pull it off again. And then it narrowed. And then it narrowed. And then it narrowed. And as we know, it took a few days, but the result changed. So if the insiders and his own buddy buddy media are telling Republicans to slow down, that's awful news for Trump, even if the mirage looks like it might happen.